This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. I'd like to introduce Naeem, who is, um, just a sec, who is uh, going to present on all his work on modelling the equine hoof which he's been um, investigating over the last three and a half years. Okay, um, Naeem. Thank you very much, Ellen. Uh, well, uh, good evening. If you are joining from North or South America, or in fact, good afternoon, if you are in Australia, where I am. My name is Naeem Akbari, and this is my uh, PhD completion seminar under the supervision of Dr. Helen Davis and Dr. Amin Komeli. So uh, an introduction about my project. Uh, the hoof is a part of a horse's body that has an essential role in equine locomotion. Uh, the hoof withstands the forces generated during weight bearing and more importantly, through the impact of the hoof hitting the ground when a horse with approximately 500 kilogram weight is trotting or galloping. So hoof has an essential role in equine balance and locomotion. Lameness in horses is mainly impacted by the problems in the foot and particularly uh, hoof shape. Studies show that uh, the hoof shape affects tension in tendons and consequently influences the soundness of uh, equine locomotion. And a more recent study showed that decreasing the difference between heel and toe angles can prevent uh, equine's injury. Uh, therefore, studies measured and assessed different hoof shape parameters such as uh, toe angle, heel angle, or uh, proximal hoof circumference and investigated different factors that can affect uh, these shape parameters. For example, uh, Belenzani showed that the mean toe angle of horse limbs increased during moderate exercise. However, PHC or proximal hoof circumference did not. Similar findings in another study showed that horses with uh, no history of lameness had no change in PHC with exercise, but horses recovering from laminitis uh, had inconsistent PHC changes with exercise. Uh, particularly to measure PHC, different techniques can be used, such as a 3D scanner, photogrammetry, MRI, and CT. Previous studies mainly used a flexible measuring tape to measure PHC. It's simple, but some doubts still exist regarding the reliability, repeatability, and accuracy of measuring tape in this context. Therefore, my project's first objective is to investigate whether the conventional tape method is accurate and reliable compared to two advanced measuring methods of uh, photogrammetry and 3D scanner. Uh, besides the importance of hoof shape, its unique structural design is also important. The hoof is made up of different components that are stiffer at the toe and quarters and are uh, more elastic and softer towards their heels. These soft tissues act as a damper and absorb shocks. Hoof has a dynamic structure and responds to change in its environment. During locomotion, the hoof deforms in a way that prevents high localized stress concentrations. Hoof shows different deformation patterns in different environmental humidity levels or different, different loading conditions, such as different gates and contact surfaces. Therefore, it is essential to understand how the hoof deforms during locomotion. Experimental studies on hoof deformation mainly used uh, the extensorimetry method, which attached strain gauges on the hoof fall uh, to measure strains during locomotion. But this method, uh, the deformation response can be obtained at limited surface areas uh, of a hoof capsule. 
And also, since manufacturers such as equine gate, environmental humidity, and hoof conformation interchangeably influence hoof deformation, a large sample size is needed to find a direct correlation between each factor and the hoof deformation. Uh, Computer-based or finite element simulation methods provide a cost-efficient means of obtaining the entire deformation of the equine hoof, which is uh, practically impossible by in vivo investigations. Uh, and because of that, FE method was used by previous researchers to study equine hoof. However, previous FE studies had some limitations. Like several FE studies have employed the linear elastic material model due to its simplicity. But hoof tissues have nonlinear behavior. Some of them developed a parametric FE model. I mean, the hoof geometry was scaled and real geometries of anatomical structures were not used. Uh, this could lead to inaccurate strain measurements. In some models, some soft tissues such as uh, the laminar junction or and digital cushion were ignored, which could affect the accuracy of the model's output. Therefore, uh, my second aim is to address previous FE models limitations and generate an advanced FE model that employs a high plastic material model and can investigate hoof capsule deformation and the effects of different factors on it. Uh, but the main limitation of all previous FE studies is that they modeled hoof only at the mid-stance of uh, the stance phase and under static loading conditions. If I want to explain it more, each movement cycle involves two phases. The stance phase in which the hoof is in contact with the ground. Then in the swing phase, the hoof is lifted from the ground. The stance phase uh, also includes four stages. The primary impact uh, that the hoof reaches the ground secondary impact, ground reaction force increase, and at mid-distance, the ground reaction force is maximum and the hoof experiences only the vertical uh, element of the ground reaction force. And at the breakover stage, the hoof starts to leave the ground. And previous studies only modeled uh, the mid-distance, but the hoof is under dynamic loading during locomotion, which should be considered in FE simulations. Uh, as I mentioned before, one of the factors that can affect hoof deformation is hoof conformation. There are some abnormal conformations such as toe in and toe out, uh, which occur when the toe points inwards or outwards. An abnormal conformation can affect equine gait. For example, the limb deviates from the sagittal plane and we see uh, winging in toe in and plating movement pattern in toe out conformations. Uh, Belenzani observed a similar winking pattern in the locomotion of a horse with uh, toe in conformation. She uh, showed how a toe in hoof deforms differently during trotting in compared with a normal hoof. However, the reason behind this remains unclear. We hypothesized that a different center of pressure pass beneath a hoof with abnormal conformation leads to its different deformation. To test this hypothesis, uh, we, uh, we modeled uh, the hoof under dynamic loading conditions and using a high plastic material model, which brings uh, the third objective of my project. It is expected that uh, hoof conformation also affects the initiation and progression of critical hoof diseases, such as laminitis. Laminitis is a serious disease that can happen because of inflammation and later a failure in the mechanical response of the laminar junction as a tissue inside the hoof. The laminar junction transfers the equine's body mass uh, from the P3 bone uh, to the hoof wall and later to the ground. Chronic laminitis is characterized by uh, the degeneration of the laminar junction tissue and a decrease in its elastic modulus and the ultimate tensile strengths. 
A symptom of chronic laminitis is a downward displacement of the third phalanx bone. The third phalanx or P3's displacement has three morphological characteristics, dorsal rotation of the P3, symmetric distal displacement of the P3, and asymmetric distal displacement of the P3 on the medial side, or it can be on the lateral side. Uh, however, interaction among hoof components is so com uh, complicated that experimental studies cannot understand the underlying reason for the P3 displacement patterns. This is where, again, FE analysis can overcome barriers to in vivo experiments. John Sola conducted a hoof FE analysis to study laminitis. They considered a relatively smaller elastic modulus for the laminar junction to simulate laminitis. Their model successfully showed a rotation of the P3. However, their model did not simulate the initiation and progression of the injury in the laminar junction tissue. So far, the distribution of the injury is also lacking. This leads uh, to my project's last objective, which aims to model laminitis and study the effect of normal and toe in hoof conformations on the failure of the laminar junction. This slide recaps the four principal objective objectives of my project, and I'm going to explain them more in detail. Objective one uh, aimed to investigate whether the conventional tape method is accurate and reliable compared to two advanced measuring methods of photogrammetry and 3D scanner to assess PHC. Our hypothesis was that the tape measurements have a good reliability and tape has a uh, comparable level of accuracy compared with the 3D scanner and photogrammetry. To compare the accuracy of the tape with photogrammetry and the 3D scanner, five pro limbs were collected from five adult horses. The limbs had normal hoof conformation and they were kept in a refrigerator with a temperature of four degrees Celsius during the test period. PHC was measured using tape, uh, photogrammetry and 3D scanner. The measurements were conducted within one week to avoid tissue shrinkage by drying out. For tape measurements, uh, the measurements were taken by two raters. In each experiment, two raters repeated five PHC measurements on five limbs. And the measuring tape was in millimeters and the PHC was measured at the coronet band uh, of each limb where the hoof fold meets the skin. For photogrammetry method, the outer surface of the hooves was painted in white uh, and was marked with black dots. Approximately at 40 centimeter distance, 25 to 30 images were taken using a, a digital camera and from different sides and angles. Each limb photographing took approximately five minutes the images were then imported to the eyewitness post software to recreate the 3D geometry. Before importing the images, it was necessary to calibrate the camera in the software. For this aim, a centimeter grid paper was placed under the hoof and the length of a pixel unit was estimated in each image based on the number of pixels in each square centimeter. After the eyewitness uh, post software recreated point clouds, uh, they were, the, they were uh, then the PHC was measured in SOLIDWORKS CAT software. The photogrammetry was performed two times uh, without repainting the hooves. The Arctic Spiced Spider 3D scanner with a working distance of 20 to 30 centimeter and 3D accuracy of 0.1 millimeter was used to scan the external surface of the hooves. The limbs were put on a rotating plate and were slowly rotated during the scan. Each limb was scanned two times. Uh, the scanning procedure took less than 10 minutes for each limb and similar to photogrammetry, the point clouds of the scanned uh, surfaces were imported as SOLIDWORKS to measure the PHC. 
the Turkey, the Turkey scanner method was considered to be the reference for accuracy, uh, accuracy comparisons. Uh, to study the reliability of uh, the PHC measurement taken by the tape, five sets of experiments involving tape measurements were conducted during six weeks. Again, in each experiment, two raters repeated five PHC measurements on five limbs, and the inter- and intra-rater reliability of tape measurements was studied uh, using Macro and Wong's reliability index. The measurements were based on a two-way mixed effect, absolute agreement, and a mean of a K raters or measurements. Uh, this slide compares the accuracy of the tape with photogrammetry and the 3D scanner. The black columns uh, are for photogrammetry. The gray is, uh, gray is the 3D scanner and white is the tape. Pairwise correlations between the 3D scanner and the other two methods showed that uh, the tape and photogrammetry both tended to overestimate the mean PHC compared to the 3D scanner. However, through the application of statistical analysis on several trials, it was concluded that the conventional tape measurements would yield higher accuracy than the photogrammetry. These graphs shows, uh, show the results of five sets of PHC measurements uh, taken by tape during a 42-day uh, period. The variation in the repeated measurements uh, of tape was up to uh, plus minus two millimeter uh, with a resolution of uh, one millimeter. Up the recording. Uh, hello and welcome everyone for part two of Naim's uh, presentation and over to you Naim. Thank you everyone for rejoining and sorry for the technical problem that we had. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this is slide I see. My laser pen. Okay, cool. So these graphs show uh, the result of five set of PHC measurements uh, taken by the tape during uh, a 42 day period. Uh, the variation in the repeated measurements of tape was up to plus minus two millimeter with a resolution of one millimeter. And this table provides ICC for inter-rater and the next one intra-rater reliability analysis for tape measurements. ICC for each experiment was estimated to be about 99%, indicating an excellent inter-rater and intra-rater reliability for tape. Uh, the output of this study was published in the Journal of uh, Equine Veterinary Science. Um, objective two, aim to investigate hoof capsule deformation and the effects of uh, different factors such as environmental humidity and loading conditions on it. We generated uh, a hoof epi model for this aim. And as I said before, uh, most, simulation, most simulation studies on equine hoof biomechanics employed linear elastic material models. But the equine hoof stress strain relationship is nonlinear, and therefore it is essential to investigate the accuracy of the linear elastic model compared to more advanced hyperelastic material models such as uh, Muni Rivelin, Neohookian, and Marlow models. Our hypothesis was that uh, the Marlow model can demonstrate better agreement with uh, in vivo observations compared to linear elastic and other hyperelastic models. This is because, uh, because of the Marlow model's strengths, which calculates the strain energy functions uh, directly from the experimental stress strain curves. In contrast, the Nohukian and Munirivalent models define explicit equations for the strain energy function. Uh, to model the hoof, first, the geometry of the hoof components was segmented from CT scans by applying density thresholds, and we generated uh, CAT 3D geometries of the components. Then uh, we conducted linear elastic and three advanced hyperelastic material models. And uh, 
associated boundary conditions were applied and we considered the ground reaction force for standing and mid stance of trotting. Nine different points of the center of pressure were considered. Uh, the deep digital flexor tendon force was applied to the distal flanks at the insertion point of the deep digital flexor tendon. And then the effect of uh, environmental humidity on the hoof wall material properties was considered at four different hydration levels. This figure uh, shows the minimum principal strain distribution on the hoof wall surface for the linear elastic and Marlow model subjected to trotting at 0% hydration level. And the results for other hydration levels. Both models demonstrated a consistent increase in minimum principal strains, which uh, when hydration increased. In both models, there are higher strains and consequently uh, stress in the proximal regions of the hoof fall and close to the carnet. This observation was also confirmed by previous FE studies and may explain commonly visible cracks at the carnet in, carnet in physiological conditions. To compare the accuracy of different material models, the minimum principal strain values were averaged at uh, lateral uh, at uh, inside frames at three dorsal medial and lateral regions, as you see in the picture. Uh, simulation results belong to 75% hydration level and linear elastic, which is the first column, um, and the no hookian gray column uh, over predicted the hoof fall strains uh, compared to the experimental measurements. The muni rivalen model with a uh, dark gray uh, predicted strains within one standard deviation from the mean experimental exper uh, measurements. And, but the Marlow model black color column uh, incurred less error than the other models in estimating the strains. I presented part of the study at uh, International Society of Biomechanics Conference in 2019 and then the part of the study's output was published in Journal of the Mechanical Behavior of Biomedical Materials. In our FE models, uh, we had two different ground reaction forces, nine different points of the central pressure, and the hoof fall material properties were incorporated at four hydration levels. So 72 different models were run, and the uh, Averaged minimum principal strain on the dorsal, lateral, and medial regions of the hoof uh, of the hoof wall uh, was reported. Since uh, since model running was time consuming, then we decided to investigate ANN potentials to predict uh, averaged minimum principal strain uh, on the hoof wall based on the input variables. A multi-layer feedforward back propagation artificial neural network with a hidden layer size of five and 500 epochs was trained to explain the relationship between the environmental humidity grand reaction force magnitude and its location as inputs and strain distribution on the hoof fall as outputs. 70% of data were used for training purpose and the rest 30% for validation. ANN uh, results showed satisfactory reliability in the prediction of hoof strains with a uh, correlation coefficient of 98, 95, and 94% for the strains in the dorsal, lateral, and medial regions, respectively. And I'm going to present this study at uh, North American Congress on Biomechanics. Our third objective was to uh, determine the effect of toe in conformation on the kinematics and deformation of the hoof. In our group and previous studies, a different kinematical behavior and deformation patterns were observed for toe in hooves. Our study aimed to understand the reason behind this difference. We hypothesized that uh, a different center of pressure pass 
underneath the hoof is the cause of different deformation patterns and hoof kinematics in toe in hooves. This study had two parts, an in vivo measurements and FE modeling. In the first part, in vivo strain measurements, uh, there were two horses, horse one with uh, normally shaped hooves and horse two uh, with a toe in conformation of the right forelimb. Strains were measured at, uh, at the dorsal, lateral, and medial regions of the forelimbs uh, hooves wall at trot. Unlike to the normal hooves, for the toe in hoof, uh, strain values were much lower at the medial relative to the lateral and dorsal aspects of the hoof wall. A plating movement pattern was also observed uh, that the right toe in hoof deviated uh, towards the medial side of the animal and was placed in front of the left uh, hoof during trotting. And the most important difference, unlike hooves with uh, normal conformation, which tend to land laterally and break over at the toe, the toe in hoof landing and break over uh, occurred uh, at the lateral aspect. Uh, we generated a hoof uh, FE model under dynamic loading uh, over a complete stride at the trot. Similar boundary conditions uh, as described before were applied to the model, but this time uh, the magnitude of the ground reaction force was not constant and varied over one stride of trot and was according to previous experimental measurements. Based on different stride characteristics that we observed in our experiments, we considered uh, two different center of pressure passes for normal and toe in hoof conformations. For the normal conformation, the center of pressure pass started from the lateral hoof and moved towards the dorsal hoof at breakover. For the toe in conformation, we considered a center of pressure pass started and remained in the lateral hoof. The grand reaction force magnitude and its dynamic center of pressure were applied to the models uh, using deload user subroutine in Abacus. Uh, the minimum principal strain was measured at three sides of lateral, medial, and dorsal on the left forelimb hoof of horse one using a string gaze and during trotting. Uh, the three corresponding regions were identified in the FE models. The minimum principal strain values were averaged at elements inside the frame uh, over a stride uh, for comparison with uh, strain gauge uh, readings. The predicted uh, minimum principal strain by FE was within one standard uh, deviation of uh, in vivo measurements over the most phases of the stance. Uh, our hypothetical central pressure pass for the toe in hoof was tested by comparing the FE results and experimental strain measurements. Uh, the predicted strains showed a similar pattern to, to the in vivo measurements. Strain values were much lower uh, at the medial uh, relative to the lateral and dorsal aspects of the hoof fall, but the magnitudes of strains obtained from the model and in vivo measurements were different. And the main reason behind this was different in vivo and FE model geometries. The geometry of the hoof in the FE model was obtained from a horse with, uh, with a body weight of 500 kilogram, uh, while uh, horse two had a 430 kilogram body weight with uh, slightly uh, smaller hooves. And similar to in vivo observation, the toe in model had a three times larger deviations uh, towards the medial side at breakover. Uh, the output of this study was published in uh, Journal of Biomechanics. Uh, our fourth objective was to determine the impact of a normal and toe in hoof on the failure of the laminar junction as occurs in chronic laminitis. We know that uh, chronic laminitis is characterized by the degeneration of uh, laminar junction tissue. 
uh, and a decrease in its elastic modulus and the ultimate uh, tensile strength. So we want to simulate injury uh, for the laminar junction using finite elements and study the distribution of injury and show how the injury distribution uh, or laminar junction failure uh, caused the displacement of the P3 bone inside the hoof uh, as a sign of laminitis. Uh, we know that central pressure beneath the hoof is one of the potential variables associated with hoof conformation. Based on uh, our previous study, the moment generated by the distance between central pressure and uh, sagittal plane would be higher for uh, the toe in hoof. Therefore, we expect uh, a severe degeneration of the elastic modulus for the toe in hoof in comparison with a normal hoof. Uh, therefore, toe in conformation can increase the risk for laminitis. And method, uh, 100 cycles of trotting load were applied to the FE model. Then the injury model was incorporated for the laminar junction tissue in our uh, user material subroutine. This model was adopted from a human knee cartilage injury model. The model starts with uh, calculating deformations and corresponding stresses. Uh, the injury occur uh, if the maximum principal stress exceeds a threshold. This threshold was set at two megapascal, which was the ultimate stress before the laminar junction tissue is ruptured. Then uh, estimating the damage factor and accordingly uh, degener uh, degenerate elastic modulus. And at the end, uh, updating uh, material uh, proper uh, material properties. Uh, this figure shows the distribution of laminar injury in the normal and toe in models after 25, 50, 75, and 100 cycles. Uh, as I mentioned before, the injury was presented uh, as degeneration of tissue elastic modulus. In both conditions, normal and toe in, the injury was uh, initiated from the quarters. However, there was a significant difference between injury distribution within the two models. Degeneration was uh, relatively severe and persistent at the lateral side in the toe in model, but injury distribution was approximately symmetric in the normal uh, hoof model. In the FE model with uh, normal conformation, injury initiated and progressed from the inner layer of the laminar junction, uh, where the laminar junction was attached to the P3 bone. And similarly, in the toe in model, the injury first influenced the laminar junction and P3 attachment, but later the damage progressed to the outer layer of the tissue where the laminar junction was attached to the internal surface of the wall. And a main limitation of the current FE model was that the laminar junction uh, was decreased. Uh, it was considered, the laminar junction was considered as a homogeneous component. And uh, it's uh, different uh, sublayers like uh, primary dermal, secondary dermal, secondary and epidermally, uh, secondary epidermal and primary epidermal uh, were not specified uh, in the model. Therefore, for a uh, therefore for a more accurate uh, model, we suggest uh, differentiating the different layers. Uh, the laminar junction degeneration after one hundred cycles caused a similar change in the uh, dermal thickness of the proximal and distal hoof. Uh, in the normal and toe in models, a decrease in the proximal distance uh, of the dermal wall, approximately uh, half, mil half millimeter, and an increase in the distal thickness uh, of the dermal wall. These changes confirm dorsal rotation of the uh, third phalanx bone or P3 bone. Uh, the data in the table shows, uh, shows that uh, the proximal distance between P3 and the ground uh, decreased in the normal and toe-in models due to laminar junction uh, degeneration. 
However, the P3 sinking was uh, significantly laterally uh, asymmetric in the toe-in model. Uh, the normal hoof had, a, had an almost symmetric distal displacement of the P3, approximately two millimeter at the lateral and medial sides. In contrast, the toe-in model had a four millimeter uh, P3 sinking at the lateral side and 1.5 millimeter at the medial side. This uh, asymmetric depth decrease uh, change indicated a medial lateral rotation and lateral uh, distal displacement of the P3. And similar, similarly, previous clinical observations have reported a medial sinking of the P3 for uh, toe out laminitic uh, hooves. Uh, the output of this project was submitted to the Equine Veterinary Journal, and it was reviewed and we submitted our response later uh, to the reviewer's comments. So to conclude, uh, the first part of the study measured equine limbs PHC by 3D scanning photogrammetry and measuring tape techniques for method comparison. Uh, through the application of statistical analysis on several trials, it was concluded that the conventional tape measurements would yield higher accuracy than the photogrammetry and comparable reliability and accuracy compared with the 3D scanner. Uh, this level of accuracy justifies the use of uh, measuring tape to assess equine PHC for testing in a wide range of clinical studies and horse management applications. The second uh, part showed that the linear elastic material model overestimates or underestimates the hoof soft tissues mechanical response. An appropriate nonlinear constitutive model, such as the Marga model, should be incorporated for uh, tissue level investigations to provide accurate tissue response at uh, physiological loading levels. And hydration level was inversely related to the hoof fall stiffness and significantly affected strain distribution. In the third part, uh, two different central pressure passes were suggested and applied to the hoof FE model that uh, successfully explained uh, the potential me uh, mechanism uh, to leading the, uh, to uh, uh, deformation and kinematic differences between uh, horses with normal and toe in hoof conformation. And, uh, and finally, uh, the last part of the study, uh, the laminar junction injury distribution in the FE models uh, provided a deeper insight into uh, the biomechanics of laminitis that may help modify its uh, treatment. Uh, for example, a custom-made uh, therapeutic horseshoe is uh, one of the treatment methods. Uh, these shoes can be designed and tested within a similar hoof uh, FE model uh, developed in this study. Examination of the design it should using computer models before uh, manufacturing can save time and cost. And the result of the current epi model showed that the injury initiated uh, from the hoof quarters, uh, regardless of toe in or normal conformations. Therefore, in therapeutic uh, shoe design, if the findings from this model fit with the clinical picture, the model suggested a shoe design that would move the central pressure to the sagittal plane of the hoof. And uh, I would like to thank uh, all professors and colleagues that helped me with this research, and especially my supervisors, Dr. Helen Davis and Amin Komeli, and all our research group members. Thank you very much. Okay. <coughs> Thank you, Naeem. So questions, please put your hand up if you have a question. Anyone? Okay, well, um, yeah. yeah. I have some, some questions, but I'm gonna let audience uh, ask their questions. If there is no question, then I can start asking. Okay, Amin, then go ahead. Nobody's okay. put their hand up yet. I, yeah, I see Tayeba uh, raised her hand, so. Uh, Hello. Yeah. Oh, right, Kate. Oh, no, Naiba. Hi, Naiba. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. 
thanks, Mary. It was a great talk. Do I ask if your project has any application for human? Mm, yeah, for human. Um, we generated a, a fee model and uh, geometries uh, came from uh, CT scan of hoof, a uh, coin hoof. Uh, I assume that uh, if we, if like, uh, if geometries come from like a, a, a human foot, like uh, with the same procedure, with the same uh, method, we can, uh, we can provide uh, like a finite element model of a human foot, uh, which then can like study a human gait, how it's like different landing, different breakover in the like human gait. And in this case, yeah, I think we can relate it, this study to human. Thank you. Thanks, Ayub. Okay. Um, Amin then? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Naim, could you please go to slide eight? No, I just saw the interesting point there. Slide number eight. Okay, so uh, at the blue arrow that I see here is ground reaction force. And then what is the other one? Difference in acceleration. In acceleration. Uh, this picture also explained the difference in acceleration, how it changed during the one stance. Like, okay. Uh, okay, yeah, that's fine. But I see that this, this blue arrow, which is ground reaction force, it's not always vertical. It seems that it has like a shear component in it, right? Uh, like in the yes. second impact phase of the stance phase, you see the curve, the arrow is not perfectly vertical. So if you go to slide 33, where you showed uh, your ground reaction force. Uh, yeah, here, I have no comment about the, the magnitude of the force, which you showed in part D, okay? I'm, I'm okay with that. But the way you applied this force uh, in your model was like a vertical force, which, which you showed in part B is uh, FGR, GRF, it's, it's vertical, right? Yes, that's true. Uh, if, I want to, hmm, uh, if I want to like explain the reason, uh, like uh, let, let's come back to picture three first. I did it to great pick. Uh, it was picture, which picture was it? Eight. Oh, it was eight, awesome. Yeah, so here we see that, yes, through the, uh, like the ground reaction force is vertical, but in other parts, it's not vertical. But uh, if we consider that this picture is two dimension and they, when it's vertical, the ground reaction force is in the middle of the horse hoof. But when it's not vertical, the ground reaction force, for example, imagine that it's 3D, it's not uh, 3D, like it's, for example, in the lateral part or in the medial part. But mm -hmm. uh, because of that, when it's metal, there is a moment uh, between the force and the center of the hoof. So if we want to show it in the two dimension, we need to have, like, to say that it's not vertical, it has a, a direction, which we say that, yeah, because we have a moment here. Like if we, uh, if you consider this force in two elements, like one vertical one uh, in this uh, direction, uh, this is uh, this is the reason. And if, if we, for example, if we also uh, consider our center of pressure pass uh, in page thirty-three. Thirty-three. Yeah. Yes. In page 33, yes. Yes, for example, when the uh, ground reaction force, because it's pass also, it's also dynamic, it's location. When, for example, the ground reaction force is not in the middle, it's in, for example, in the lateral side, there is again a moment uh, uh, between the, the force and, uh, there, is a di there is a distance between the force and the center of the hoof, which makes that, uh, that moment. So, uh, so we considered, uh, like, I, I assume, my, my, my assumption is that uh, in this case, uh, we, can, we can consider uh, like force vertical, but because it's uh, the location changes, we have the same moment as we, uh, as experimental measurements say that, for example, it's not vertical. So by, by considering a path for the center of pressure, 
you're gonna like simulate the effect of the moment that the shear force has, right? But uh, you know, in the figure that you showed, you still have a shear force. So in that like to the image that you showed me, uh, you have a shear force. You so you have a shear stress, a shear strain because of that shear force over here, uh, because you you have um, uh, a vertical force. You are not going to get that shear. That's uh, true. Even That's... the effect of that moment gives you a normal stress. It's not going to give you shear, right? That's true. That, that's a that's a, a limitation of actually. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, I, I agree with you. That's a limitation of that's the study. That that you, uh, it works to discuss in your thesis. If you know the magnitude, you know there is a possibility that the magnitude of the shear force is negligible compared to the normal force. Uh, if if that's the case, then that's a good justification that you can say that it's negligible, so it's not going to affect the results significantly. But if it is uh, not negligible, then you have to make a discussion like in, in the future, that would be a good improvement if someone's going to continue this work. Mm -hmm. I think I see then the shear force would be an important topic. Yeah, that's true. The magnitude of the vertical element is much more than the, the shear force, but it's true. I think uh, this is the limitation of the study. And if someone wants to uh, like uh, make it more advanced, uh, it's yeah, it is better that to recommend that shear force as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Amin. Um, no other hands up. Did you have another question, or shall I ask? Yeah, yeah. If there is no question, I can continue. But if there yes. is any. I'm going to stop here. You can continue. I have one, but it's only a small one. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, objective four, which is study the failure. Uh, okay, so um, do you know if the, okay, is there any, is the lanyard junction fibrous tissue? It is, yes, it has, uh, it has okay. fibers inside. <laughs> So, uh, did you model fibers at all? No, uh, th that is actually, uh, I believe that is the, the main limitation of this uh, study that we considered uh, laminar junction homogeneous and we didn't consider its different layers, uh, fibers inside the direction of the fibers and small, so many like uh, small but important details of the tissue. Yeah, I think that was, as I remember, I think that was a comment from one of the reviewers. So, uh, yeah, make sure that you have like a good, good discussion about this. That why we didn't uh, model the fiber. Uh, and then, a uh, question relating to this, uh, I realized that the damage, uh, everything starts from lateral side, like every pro problem for the. Uh, for uh, normal model, uh, it started from a quarters, both lateral and medial. Uh, but for toe in model, it's like it was uh, more concentrated in the lateral part. But for normal models, it was symmetric. And then in a slide 42, you showed that uh, what your finds have been predicted in terms of uh, sinking the laminar junction, it perfectly describes what happens in the in vivo. But did you get any result that uh, this agrees with the in vivo observation? Uh, for you mean for page forty-two or yeah or like, like in overall like uh, when you studied this like the damage propagation did you get any like uh, deformation any like uh, rotation of a component something that uh, doesn't agree with the in vivo yeah uh, so in the model that we had uh, we had a toe in model and we showed that uh, the bone its displacement is asymmetric and it's more in the lateral side. So we have a kind of rotation and it's more uh, displacement is more in the lateral side. And we had a toe in hoof. In some uh, in vivo uh, experiments, previous studies, they had toe out foot exactly reverse and they had uh, as, again asymmetric distal displacement of the P3, but this time in the medial side. So it was tore out in the medial side, we had tore in in the lateral side. So uh, in this case, we suggest that uh, uh, our findings, FE findings uh, confirm also 
uh, actually the previous uh, observation previous observations come from our uh, FE uh, yeah. outputs. I'm looking for yeah, but I'm looking for any disagreement with any disagreement. Uh, not to be honest, I haven't found, but it might be. It's maybe it's possible to find, but I myself I haven't seen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because if there's any disagreement, I would like to investigate what could be the problem, how we can improve uh, the model, okay? Yeah. Uh, good. Okay, I'm going to stop here. Thank you, Naim. Okay, well, if there's no more questions, um, then thank you very much. And